Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to echo that welcome to our panel addressing online hate. As Lewis mentioned, my name is Julia Gegenheimer. I'm a special litigation counsel with the Civil Rights Division Criminal Section. I am joined today by four incredible panelists who are truly, truly experts on this topic and who are coming to us with a diverse set of perspectives and experiences to share. Dr. Marianne Franks is a law professor and the Michael R. Kine Distinguished Scholar Chair at the University of Miami School of Law. Professor Franks, Marianne, is also the President and Legislative and Tech Policy Director at the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative. We're also joined by Mary McCord, the Executive Director of the Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection and a visiting law professor at Georgetown University Law Center. She is also a DOJ alum, having served for many years with the U.S. Attorney's Office in Washington, D.C. She served for many years as uh, an AUSA in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Washington, D.C. Oh, and it looks like my audio is off. Okay, so it seems like many of you can still hear me, so I'll continue. I apologize for those who are having trouble hearing me. Um, I want to add that uh, Mary was also the Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General and the Acting Assistant Attorney General for DOJ's National Security Division. Kaya Morris is not only a former member of the Vermont State Legislature, she was the second Black female legislator in that state's entire history. She now serves as the Movement Politics Director for Rights and Democracy Vermont and provides workshops and presentations on very important issues of diversity, equity, and leadership. David Sifri is the Vice President of the Anti-Defamation League Center for Technology and Society, an organization that he joined after extensive experience in the tech industry himself. With ADL, Dave serves as a really valuable resource to legislators, journalists, universities, community organizations, and the tech platforms on some of the very issues that we're here to discuss today. So with that set of expertise, we are very, very lucky to be able to learn from our panelists today about what is broadly termed online hate. And I think much of what we just heard from Ms. Dumson, who spoke about the online hate that she experienced, really highlights that this is a challenging problem in so many ways. It's challenging not only because the problem itself can take on many different forms, but also because it is sometimes easier to see the obstacles to combating or addressing online hate than it is to identify or certainly to implement the solutions. So those are the issues we hope to tackle today. What is online hate? Who does it affect? And importantly, what can we do about it? So Dave, I'd like to start with you. For the past several years, the Anti-Defamation League, ADL, has published an analysis of online hate and harassment. And one of the components of that analysis is a breakdown of the quote, anatomy of harassment as it's termed. Based on that, could you give us an overview of the various forms that online hate and harassment take? Um, is it all direct threats, for instance, or are there other ways that hate manifests itself online? Thank you, Julia. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak to all of you. Um, each year for the past three years, ADL Center for Technology and Society surveyed American adults. And in our just released 2021 nationally representative survey of internet users, 41% of Americans report being harassed online sometime during their lifetime. 27% reported having experienced severe harassment, physical threats, sexual harassment, stalking, and sustained harassment. So that's really one in four of you. So if it's not you directly, it's one in four of your friends, your coworkers, and your community. Next slide. 
Um, LGBTQ plus respondents at 52% experienced far higher rates of severe harassment than all other groups. The next highest amount of severe harassment reported was from Muslim Americans at 36%, comparable to 32% in last year's survey. And severe harassment among female identified respondents was more than one in four, 29%. Next slide. Most disturbingly, our survey this year found that Asian American people reported higher levels of severe harassment. Again, severe harassment being defined as physical threats, sexual harassment, stalking, and sustained harassment. And we've heard examples of that already just in today's featured speakers. We can't look at this in isolation. So despite lots of talk of self-regulation from technology companies, the level of online hate and harassment reported by users barely shifted when compared to data from a year ago. And in the case of our Asian American population, things got substantially worse. Next slide, please. Well, so Dave, I want, in... to jump in. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. I want to jump in right there and ask Please. you a follow-up about this slide. So it, it looks like a lot of this conduct, when it's happening online, is occurring primarily on some of the most popular social media platforms. Is that right? That's correct. Um, and I think it's important to note that this is these big tech platforms are where people are spending most of their time. Um, and it, you know, it doesn't mean that it's only happening on the big tech platforms, um, but we are seeing the outsized responsibilities of these large firms that yes, while there are some fringe sites like HN and Gab were mentioned, um, it's the big tech platforms where the largest effects were felt, where 75% of the respondents who reported harassment reported that some of that harassment happened on Facebook. And let's just go to the last slide. Oh, oh it looks well, like that. Uh, that's last. okay. Uh, okay, I'll just note then that uh, the incidence of severe harassment, even though while it didn't lessen, what was very disappointing is that respondents reported that platforms did less to address these threats. 41% of people stated that social media platforms did not take any action on the threatening content. And over a third of respondents, 38%, didn't even report the content in question to the platform because they felt that nothing would happen. Only 14% of those surveyed reported that the company deleted the threatening content, which was actually a significant drop from 22% a year ago. And lastly, 17% stated that the platform actually blocked the user who posted the threatening content, which was a sharp decrease from last year's result of 28% reporting. And Dave, I want to follow up with you quickly. Um, you, you mentioned the severe harassment that many users are experiencing online. Um, and I think for those of us who are maybe not in the one in four, who might be lucky enough to have not experienced this or seen this ourselves, could you talk a little bit more about the different forms that this harassment can take? Uh, you know, I think we can envision the direct threats that one might receive online, but are there other ways uh, that perpetrators are kind of carrying out this online hate? Certainly, and, and actually I wanna note and really congratulate Ms. Dumpson on her testimony today. And, and just like to have the courage to be able to speak out about these kinds of experiences because you know, this is what many people are tending to experience, right? This, the, that it's physical threats, sexual harassment, stalking, which, often includes doxing. And for, you know, for those of you who are unaware, right, doxing is the, the, um, the release of personal information uh, with malicious intent on the internet. So you know, where you live, where, uh, where your children go to school, you know, these kinds of questions, where you work, 
um, with the purpose of harassment. And, um, and then there's just sustained harassment. So where an individual piece of content in and of itself might not be harassing, but it's the constant, constant harassment over and over again, um, which leads people to um, you know, have a tremendous sense of fear. Uh, and you know, that you don't even know where it's coming from. Sometimes it's right next door, or it could be you know, somewhere far away. And one of the most recent things that we've been seeing is an increase in what, what's called swatting, where um, people file a false police report uh, and they will call saying that, you know, you are doing something terrible, right? You know, a recent example was a gamer who, you know, there was a police report called that he had shot up his house and was holding his parents hostage and that this causes a SWAT team to respond and come out to the house, often with disastrous impacts. So, so there is some very real impact here uh, around this harassment beyond purely online. And Dave, when we think about what motivates online hate and harassment, uh, several federal agencies, including DOJ, have recognized the prevalence of white supremacist ideologies motivating hate crimes and threats against certain groups. Does ADL's survey or ADL's analysis suggest uh, that people are being targeted because of their visible identities? Yes, uh, there is certainly evidence to show that uh, people are, especially in you know because of protected attributes, that um, that there is a a tremendous amount of hate and harassment that's displayed towards them, and you know certainly I'd say there's a majority that we're seeing coming from white supremacy and other forms and other extremism. Um, 75% of the murders that ADL tracked that were hate related. Um, were in that realm, but it's not only right-wing extremism. It's important to note that um, there are other forms of harassment here as well. Mariana, I think this is a good time to turn to you. I want to get your perspective on who, on this issue of who is targeted by online hate and on one group in particular. Um, you have researched and written a great deal about the online harassment of women. And now misogyny, of course, is not unique to the internet, but has the internet affected how, when, or even how many women are being targeted and harassed? Well, as you say, misogyny is not something that the internet has invented. Um, we have had deep sexist structures in our society forever. Uh, violence against women, exploitation, subordination, these are all things that are really part and parcel of most cultures. But what we have seen with the advent of the internet is an acceleration of these harms. We've seen a kind of gamification of these harms. What you have when you have existing biases and prejudices and tendencies towards extremism, you combine those with technology that allows you to be anonymous, with technology that allows you to aggregate and speak to larger platforms. Uh, you have technology that allows you to amplify your message and to turn your harassment of an individual person into a kind of spectacle for others to join in on. And the internet also really increases the incentives for people to engage in these types of behaviors at the same time as it makes it much easier for people to participate in these behaviors. If 50 years ago you had to spend a lot of physical resources or time, maybe even money to engage in harassment against another person, today you can do it without ever leaving your house. And what you can get from it um, by doing it in these semi-public forums on social media, et cetera, is you can get a lot of social validation. You can get encouragement. You can get validation that the way that you feel about your private resentments and entitlements is valuable. And so there is this extent uh, to which the internet really does encourage all of those really terrible impulses of misogyny and really does uh, fan the flames of them in a certain way and allows people to coordinate really massive campaigns of harassment against individual victims, as we've already heard from um, several people today. So it seems like there might be a group of people or individuals out there who otherwise might not be so motivated to take action that because as, as you described, there is this gamification of online hate are now kind of motivated more or the barriers to entry are slightly lower. Is that right? 
Exactly right. We've always had people who would have been determined to harass or um, ex um, harass or abuse women, regardless of how hard it was. And there would always be people who would never do that, regardless of how easy it became. But there is a very large middle section to our society um, that could be moved in either direction, depending on how much easier it became to, it, to engage in this type of behavior and whether or not it afforded any benefits. And so when you've got this sense of um, community, right, that some people, um, if we think about how deeply held the misogynist beliefs are of groups like incels or involuntary celibates, um, of other people considering themselves to be men's rights activists, these are people who maybe would have experienced their resentment and their entitlement as temporary stages. They might've thought of them as personal moments of failure or lack of success. They may have attempted to get beyond that, um, to try to become a different a person in some ways or to grow and develop as a person. But what the internet does in a lot of these sub-communities is it encourages those people to stay stuck, to say you can never get any better, nothing will ever improve, you should turn your sense of resentment, your sense of rejection, you should turn that into hostility and to hatred, and that's where you will get your social validation from. And these communities are very, very focused on turning that ideology into one that normalizes um, really objectification of women, dehumanization, maybe more importantly, dehumanization of women that really crosses over between uh, a kind of hyperbolic kind of statement about how much they hate women or resent women and becomes very, very close to inciting people to actually engage in violence against women for, for social validation. And that this isn't just a problem because it affects women, although one would hope that that would be enough of a reason for us to care about how often women are targeted but it's also become because that strategy and that sense of entitlement is at the root of essentially all online extremism. If we look at a phenomenon like 2014 with Gamergate, where you had this concerted effort by just a few men at the very beginning to try to torment and harass and really um, go after women who were achieving things in the gaming world and how that spun into this incredibly coordinated campaign of harassments, death threats, revenge porn, um, uh, all kinds of uh, bomb threats, actual threats to people's physical safety, dressed up in this view of, oh, we're trying to be ethical in gaming journalism. That isn't just something that happens to one group or at one moment, it becomes the playbook essentially for every form of online extremism, whether that's insurrectionism or COVID denial or anything else we can think of. Now, you mentioned one term that I want to follow up on a little bit, the, the term incel. Um, my question for you on that is, would you mind briefly explaining what that term means and, and what the incel movement is, as well as you know, how does that movement fit into the broader sphere of online misogyny? Certainly. So the term was originally coined actually by a woman back in the 90s, and involuntary celibate was meant to be a term to uh, communicate individuals' feelings of um, lack of success and making intimate connections with other people. But what it became, especially in the 2000s and especially around the time of uh, 2014 or so, really became this movement that was taken over by men in particular, particularly white men, younger men, who saw it not as, not as a sense of, this is something that I'm disappointed with in my life, but rather as an identity that it became a way of um, this kind of subgroup, you could say, of a larger collection of misogynists or other people who were dissatisfied with their lives. There was a specific younger group within that subset that decided to make involuntary celibate incel their identity. And that identity was very much predicated on um, describing and uh, propagandizing against uh, uh, what, so what was perceived as women's treacherous nature. So, so much of what happens on these forums is the sharing of deeply misogynistic content, these deeply um, biased views about women that all stem from this fundamental sense of rejection and that fundamental sense of entitlement. Um, and again, that's important to underscore because it isn't just going to stay within the context of sexual success or sexist stereotyping, but actually become the broad base for essentially every online extremism movement, especially in the United States, it's one of its fundamental planks being the sense of entitlement, whether that's entitlement to the uh, political leaders you think should be in office, or whether that's entitlement to not having to obey certain kinds of health and safety regulations, that sense that one person, that individual, 
uh, should be the center of the universe. And usually it is correlating with white men in particular, feeling that the world is rejecting them, feeling that they are not needed anymore, that they are not valued in a way. And the incel culture is a fairly small subculture, but it really is the distillation and maybe the, the most extreme version of that kind of resentment and crosses over into extraordinarily um, dangerous real life violence as we've seen in mass shootings, including Elliot Roger in 2014, who left a manifesto that explained that what he was trying to do was to punish women for rejecting him. And since that time, there have been at least half a dozen other mass shooters who have invoked Elliot Rogers' name as a kind of saint, as someone to follow, as someone to plan their attacks around, underscoring the fact that women um, in the crosshairs of these kinds of communities are really the canaries in the coal mine. Thank you. And you know, we've been discussing the groups or the communities who are most often affected or targeted by online hate. Uh, but I think it's important to remember and to focus on the individual people who go through these experiences. So I want to turn to you, Kaya, uh, because unfortunately, you have experienced some of this conduct firsthand. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you were the second Black female legislator in Vermont's history. After very successful terms in the state legislature and while you were running for re-election, you were targeted by many of the types of hate and harassment that we've been discussing and even beyond. Uh, to the extent that you feel comfortable sharing, could you tell us about your experience? For sure, for sure, thank you. And it's uh, an honor to be here and a part of these conversations. And there's so many powerful insights that we've heard already. And I think it's important to continue to draw these links and to press ourselves um, to do better. And when we get to do better, I'll tell you a little bit more about what that means from my vantage. So um, so yeah, so it was um, a really interesting piece that we found there was a distinct difference in the way that the public chose to engage with um, elected officials um, with the beginning of Donald Trump's presidency. And it is an important timestamp that I know makes some folks uncomfortable, but these are the moments when we see the rise and um, the resurgence, I shouldn't say rise, I think white supremacy culture has been here for a while and I think that um, targeted and uh, racialized gendered um, violence has never gone away, but there was a distinct uptick and an distinct um, kind of uh, veracity to the way that it started unfolding right around that time. So myself going back up for um, re-election, I ended up um, receiving a tweet that came from folks associated with InfoStormer that had tagged someone in my local community who was actually a constituent of mine, unbeknownst to me, to really question, you know, basically who's this black woman that's running for office. And so it ensued a series of incredibly um, vulgar tweets. This individual was somebody who was an avowed neo-Nazi, had swastikas attached to their literal profile name, was very, um, very visibly clear um, that that was part of their identity and that's who they were associated with. And this person was affiliated with and in community with a local white supremacist group called the Green Mountain Goys at that time. Now, um, as it is for anyone who will tell you when you're experiencing this sort of hate and especially in an online forum there is an expectation that as you know there was never a question in my mind as a black woman serving in one of the whitest states in the union that i would experience racialized hate there was no question about it gendered hate not a question about it and so when it comes to you online you sort of halfway want to shrug it off but at the same time you don't we know what these hate symbols mean we know what they feel like to your bones and there is a chilling effect and a terrorism that happens almost immediately upon recognition of what those things are and so it was something that i initially i said okay i don't know who this guy is i don't know why he's tagging me i don't know why there he's specifically going through this effort to point out who i am and all these sorts of things but um i sent it along to our local law enforcement and this is a really key piece especially as we're talking to a legal community and the broader um, nation that's trying to wrestle with what how to deal with hate um, that's going to be a really important part of both this story and the stories of many of the people that are building this data that we're talking about today, that are creating these narratives that we're all reflecting on throughout this conference. So going to law enforcement and saying, you know, if I was a friend and this a friend had shown me this, I would tell them to send this along to law enforcement just in case. What then began from there? 
increased uh, tenfold because my my concern from the beginning was not necessarily who is this one individual who had a very violent past um, had um, criminal charges was on probation having to do with an attempted murder of his wife his ex-wife um, and you know, recognizing that this is somebody who has former military experience and had great severe PTSD, obvious mental health issues. But it was always a concern for me because as you know, um, as I think what what uh, Dr. Franks was speaking with regards to is the spectacle of then saying we're going to target this individual, who else answers the clarion call? Right. This is always the concern that it's never always just that one person, but who else is watching? Who else may choose to take that as a call to arms? Who may choose to take what you are saying about that individual and the way that they're being framed, that organization, that institution, that movement, those places and those targets, who's going to act on that? And that was always something that was of concern to me. It was not of concern to our local law enforcement. And you can find we ended up um, going through a years long battle of terrorism that started online and ended up very much in the real world with break-ins happening into our home with youth that had been radicalized that lived down the street who were um, doing very organized campaigns of terror things that had been found um, that only came into my purview from the dark web through different media sources who had the ability to go and find these pieces i mean we are a small bucolic state and so even as i started receiving death threats on computers and such our state was not prepared to even manage or really assess what was happening. It had to go to the child pornography division because we didn't have an online hate division. And what we also have, which was really important to know about this, was as this terror was expounding, and as I became more and more of a target, was that we did not have a mechanism for our um, family to feel protected because it was dismissed as being unimportant. It's just political speech. It's just First Amendment. They have a right. And there was very much an apathy. And uh, we found out eventually um, a direct accomplice and um, total uh, malfeasance on the part of our law enforcement with regards to how they choose to manage um, the, my family's case. So this started there and we started experiencing these things, vandalism on our property, swastikas, pace, you know, right on the routes that I would always walk with my dog every single day, things happening in real time. And then what really brought it to a head. And again, these were the things that I was trying to express as the canaries in the coal mine, <laughs> as we we're talking about here, that were just not being given the attention they deserved, was that we had a series of gun bills that had come through. Our governor had required that we take a look at them. And I served on the Judiciary Committee at that point. OK, and so he had um, put these in place and required that we move and look towards these bills because of the fact that we had merely escaped a school shooting. Found well, um, you know, manifesto, the whole bit. And so they said, we need to figure out ways to address this. I was not the bill sponsors. I wasn't the one reporting them on the floor. But these groups and specific individuals who had aligned themselves with these movements, if we want to call them that, chose to raise me up as not only the author, but the instigator for all of them, which then made me the target of fringe Second Amendment groups who were also aligned with many of these hate groups. And that's how it goes. It never pulls in people saying, hey, we hate all Mexicans. Why don't you come join our club? It starts with a simple conversation or an area of connectivity around, we got to protect our guns. And while you're here, aren't you pissed about how those Mexicans are taking your jobs? So they ended up building a strong local movement and had the support of other national groups who know very well how to make these orchestrated attacks happen and do so constantly dancing a line of those First Amendment rights in a way that will keep them always out of hair's breadth, uh, uh, just a little touch away from ever experiencing any sort of prosecution. And so in my circumstance, I can tell you while the violence was coming into real life and the impacts that it had on my family were significant, I'm here in this esteemed position as an elected official and my family's worried about me being killed on a daily basis. 
My mother has to live with the pain of those tears every day for me doing what she raised me to do, to fight for people's rights, to support and enable the collective liberation of all of us so that we can all live fruitful, just filled lives. And for that, I deserve to constantly have a target on my back because there is a, a need to brush it aside. So this person, you know, one of the things that happens within this too, and I appreciated David raising the, the question around severe harassment, right? So what is that? And what does that mean to people? Because as one or two tweets, severe harassment, if they cause terror in the person who receives them, are lawn signs or leaflets left behind significant enough that will consider it to be serious, they'll say, oh, but this person got 300 emails. So they're a real victim. Yours is not as important. But it doesn't take that much to not only impact that individual, but to impact the communities. And as we even heard earlier, the lived identities of those who share those identities with those individuals. Because here, as this person of power, in the seat of prominence, I was not able to get the protections that my family deserved because our laws are inadequate to deal with those. Um, so we were impacted by a Supreme Court decision from the Vermont Supreme Court that really put, um, it's caused issues ever since. It's made it near impossible for people to get the justice that we have um, heard about today. There were groups that would not take on my case. It is next to impossible to find legal counsel who are willing to take on these harassment cases within Vermont because there is a, a hesitancy to lose and an unwillingness to test the courts. And that is the only way that rulings get overturned is if you have the courage to step into it, but people will not do it unless it is a slam dunk. And so instead we have our NAACP with dossiers this thick of people they have to say, I'm so sorry, there is nothing I can do. And that is on us as a nation. Um, so I'm sorry, I went on for a while. I do definitely have other thoughts. <laughs> I'm happy to reflect and I'm again, I'm honored for the work that others are bringing into this conversation today. Thank you so much for that, Kaya. I, I definitely wanna circle back um, when we talk about what we can do to combat online hate. Uh, I know that must have been just incredibly difficult for you and your family and those close to you to go through. So I wanna thank you so much for sharing that experience with us. Um, Mary, I want to briefly draw you in on this. Kaya described what she went through as starting online, um, but actually escalating to in-person intimidation and threats, including some really disturbing things like a home invasion. And you have a great deal of experience combating foreign terrorism, where people are often recruited or radicalized online, but then go on to carry out violence in the real world. What can you tell us about how that happens, how online hate becomes offline real world violence? Thanks, Julia and uh, Kaya and Marianne and David, thank you for all your comments. And Kaya, I was just like behind you going, yeah, yeah, because uh, because there's so much work I think we need to do. And I think, and we're going to get to this. We really do need to uh, update First Amendment jurisprudence to recognize social media, because as Julia was just indicating with her question, you know, it's not online hate doesn't just stay online. And, you know, I saw this when I was uh, in the National Security Division and I moved over to the National Security Division from the U.S. Attorney's Office just one month before ISIS declared a caliphate. Um, and what was so different and so dangerous about ISIS as compared to Al-Qaeda. Now, obviously, I'm not suggesting Al-Qaeda was not dangerous. My goodness, they're responsible for 9-11. But the, the ability to use social media to recruit, to propagandize, to plot, to plan, um, just made everything go so much faster, right? Al-Qaeda had to spend a lot more time actually recruiting people through face-to-face -face types of encounters um, and spent much, much longer vetting, et cetera, and was very, very careful about who they were engaging with and who they were asking to come train with them, who they were asking to commit attacks in the US. With social media, that all just happens in nanoseconds. We and the FBI had something that we used to call the flash to bang from the first time somebody might be on your radar as susceptible and vulnerable to recruitment to the point where they might actually do something, whether it meant get in a plane to fly to Syria to join ISIS or to actually commit attack right here in the homeland. It could be so fast. 
And it's partly best because of the easy accessibility and ubiquity of firearms in the US and other means to commit attacks as well, but that's a different topic. Um, so on social media, we saw that used by ISIS, we saw it convert not just from sort of propagating that hatred of the West, um, hatred of the infidels, um, and, and recruitment of people to try to want to do something about it, but they also pitched, you know, they had a little something for everybody. They also pitched the utopia of a state under Sharia law, right, with health care and medical care and a, an educational system that uh, would be available to everyone. And so, and they use social media for this as well. So they had slick, you know, um, videos showing uh, soldiers with kittens and cotton candy and the lovely new schools they were building. Then they had also videos that showed violence and beheadings, et cetera. So no matter what was going to be use, you know, uh, um, attractive to those who were vulnerable to it, there was something there. And they used that to make people feel like you could get a sense of belonging. You know, Marianne talked about people feeling entitled or, and feeling like there's something missing in their own lives, right? This gave people a sense of belonging. But we're seeing that right here, and we've been seeing it for a long time, but I think it has gone into overdrive in the last couple of years um, when it comes to domestic extremist views. And you know, sometimes this is a, a, a confusing distinction between domestic extremism and the international extremism. But, you know, and I think we probably should get rid of those uh, distinctions because as we know from some of the worst domestic extremist attacks, the El Paso shooters already been mentioned, um, Dylan Roof in, in the AME Church in Charleston, Robert Bowers in Pittsburgh, these folks were also praising and inspired by people overseas also engaged in white supremacist type of um, violence like the Christchurch shooter, like Anders Breivik in Norway. So we no longer have you know, lines uh, around the US that keep us somehow apart or different from other forms of international extremism. But we, what we've seen uh, more and more and more is that online hate, that online recruitment le leads to real world violence. And we've seen it in the stories told today, the stalking, the harassment, the physically coming to people's homes. But we've also seen it in the group violence, right? If you just look at 2020, we had through the propagation of online hate and anti-government sentiment and, and political violence, you had groups, you know, while armed storming state houses in opposition to public health related orders, right? When George Floyd was murdered, you had the online hate and vitriol causing groups of people to come out armed in opposition to people peacefully demonstrating for racial justice. Um, sometimes resulting in tragedies like the shootings in Kenosha and elsewhere. Um, and then, of course, surrounding the election and the stop the steal rhetoric and disinformation uh, and just outright lies, we saw a coalescence online of militia violent extremists, accelerationist white supremacist groups, QAnon and conspiracy theorists, and other just just conservative moms and pops who are in the silos of online social media and got sucked into this, culminating, of course, in the insurrection on January 6th, but not stopping there, because now we're seeing this online hate translate into physical, real world threats and intimidation of school board members, school teachers, public health officials, election officials, Right? These types of threats are not protected by the First Amendment, but there's a lot of confusion out there about how the First Amendment applies online. And I, and I think that's probably what we'll talk about here soon. Yeah, so I think you, know, you touched on this, uh, Mary, and we'll certainly talk more about the First Amendment. You know, the overall uh, important question I think then becomes, uh, in addition to what has been done about this already, maybe even more pressing, what more can we do? Uh, Kaya, I, I want to ask you a brief question because you, in describing your experience, uh, described that it started out as some tweets. And uh, my question for you is, you know, what was the response, if any, from the social media platform where those threats started? Did the platform remove the posts or address the problem in some way? 
No, neither. And there, are, I've yet to see a social media platform that responds to anything. Even when I have placed the complaints myself, even when other people have done so um, in mass, um, except for YouTube. YouTube took down one video, <laughs> but absolutely not. Twitter didn't do anything. Facebook did nothing. Neither of them have responded. And more often than not, they would say, this does not rise to the level of um, our violating our community norms. And so they would just choose to ignore it. So Dave, I want to turn to you then. Um, you know, some of the analysis that you discussed earlier highlighted that this problem of online hate is occurring as Hyatt experienced on some of the biggest, most popular, widely used social media platforms. Um, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on what those tech platforms can do about it. Um, if you could tell us you know, if anything has already been done, if there's already been any reform, and then certainly you know, what you see as possible future reforms. Yeah. So first, let me start with something very constructive, a very constructive suggestion. So uh, I actually, my, me and my team, we literally have a regular cadence of meetings with top executives at all of the major, let's just call them responsible actor uh, uh, platforms. Uh, and you know, we bring them constituent complaints and issues and very often talk to them about issues of harassment uh, that have otherwise gone unaddressed. So the first thing I'm just gonna say for everyone here, and you, know, you can actually please you know, post the, this to others, you can go to adl.org slash report incident if you are, if you know someone or you, or this is an issue that's happening for you, right? We can't promise that every single thing is going to get addressed, but I can make sure. I, I tell you, I sit down and talk to these folks uh, and we press these issues very hard. It is incredibly disappointing that not a single big tech platform has an actual phone number that you can call or a human being that an average citizen who is a user of their platform or as they affectionately call you, the product, um, that no one can actually contact them other than these online actions, which unfortunately they rarely use as signal in their algorithms to remove and enforce this content. So, so that's the first thing I would just recommend, adl.org slash report incident. Please let us know. Uh, and you know, we want to you know, help. The, the larger issue here is that, unfortunately, the way that these business models are constructed, the incentive systems that big tech tends to be built around is one where you know, taking care of the safety of its users are considered a cost center. And in fact, it's worse than that, that what these companies are built around is getting you and keeping you on the platform, what they call engagement. And engagement means that they track things like how many shares has something gotten? How many likes has it gotten? How many people have commented on a particular piece of content? And they will use that to then promote or amplify that content, right? So what shows up first, second, and third in your newsfeed is absolutely tuned to you based on signals that it is tracking from all of these other people. And what we have found, and not a surprise, and the, the Facebook whistleblower leaks only confirm this, is that these algorithms tend to be much more polarizing content. They tend to enforce tribal norms, right? These ideas that I'm right, you're wrong, and us versus them mentality, and other forms of controversy and conspiracy, which, by the way, leads to extremist recruitment and the recommendation systems that are built in, which are then designed to suck you deeper in and therefore become better product so that they can sell you more things. This is at the heart of what their incentive systems are structured around. So unfortunately, I don't believe that they can do this through self-regulation. And so ADL deeply believes that the time has come to be able to create systems. And it really needs to be a whole of society approach 
right? It's not about just one law or one approach. It's about really looking at a variety of approaches to create disincentives to this kind of content and this kind of amplification to de-amplify, mitigate, and ameliorate, and most importantly, to take care of the people who are affected. So when it comes to creating those disincentives, um, potentially through government regulation or society-wide policy, uh, Marianne, I actually I want to turn to you and get some of your thoughts on this. You have helped write templates for laws addressing forms of online harassment like sexual extortion and image exploitation. What do you think can be done in the policy realm to address online hate more broadly? I think the first thing we can and should do is to reject the very simplistic First Amendment um, kind of misinformation that we're all being fed so much these days, which is this idea that the First Amendment is like a commandment that was written in the heavens that the way it's being interpreted today is the only way it could possibly be interpreted, that it can't evolve, that there's no other way to read it other than let the harassers do what they will until they kill someone. Uh, we need to confront the fact that we have always had limitations on what is considered to be protected speech. Those calculations are usually loosely based on some calculation about benefits versus costs. As much as the Supreme Court claims that's not what they are doing, there is no other way really to coherently explain why, for instance, child pornography is not protected or why fighting words or incitement um, is not protected. So the first thing is for us to be a lot more honest about what the First Amendment actually is. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a document that can be read in multiple ways and has been read in multiple ways. The other thing we need to do is to think about how much the internet has transformed the way we speak to each other. If it is as transformative as everyone says, then that means that it must have some kind of major impact on the way that we speak. So that if we, our last guidance on incitement as a doctrine comes from 1969, we think about all the ways that people's communication dynamics have changed since then. You no longer have to rile up a crowd to immediately go and hurt someone. You can just send a tweet. These are things that need to be taken seriously into, into consideration. We also need to think about who the First Amendment and the idea of free speech has been, whose interest has it been serving? If what it really means at the end of the day is that we can hear Nazis really loudly, but we don't get to hear other people, right? That we don't hear Kaya as much, right? That we don't hear Taylor as much. Then we're making a choice about whose speech we're actually trying to protect. And so we need to be honest about that, that we are making choices. And that if we're going to talk about free speech consequences and use that as, a, as part of the way that we assess the situation, we need to spend so much more time talking about the chilling effect, as Kaya said. We need to spend so much more time talking about the women who are um, prevented from ever becoming politicians the women who um, are forced to abandon their career aspirations, the women who are targeted by non-consensual non pornography or by rape threats who leave before they ever get started. Um, we need to think about how much it silences them, how much it changes their educational opportunities, their employment opportunities, their visibility and culture, their civic participation. We are losing women's voices. We are losing people's voices because of this very particular elitist version of the First Amendment that we are tending to uphold. So we have to take account. Um, we have to take account of that. We have to reckon with that. We have to reckon with the fact that this model of speech only ever being answered by more speech, that that's the only thing we can do, simply is inadequate when we're talking about unanswerable forms of speech. When someone publishes your home address, there is no counter speech to that. When someone posts intimate information about you that can't be taken back, there is no counter speech. So these are sophisticated, important ideas that we actually have to think about if we're going to be committed to these principles that we claim we are committed to some of the time. The First Amendment isn't the only amendment. We also should care as much about the 14th Amendment as we do about the first. And the two of them have to be read in context with each other. There's either equal protection of the laws or there is injustice. And that is that should be our starting point. So I think there's, there's a, a, a cultural shift and a doctrinal shift that needs to happen when it comes to whose freedom of speech we are protecting and how. And we also have to think about the role, as, as David was saying, of the intermediaries here, who are not just bystanders, but who are actually profiteering from a lot of this really terrible speech and should no longer be allowed to simply say, well, this is what users are doing to each other. We're mere platforms. There's no such thing as a mere platform. We've known that for years. We're getting some more documentation of it these last few weeks, but we've always known this. They are participants. They are complicitous in a lot of this um, activity, and they should be treated as such. 
And that can be done a couple of different ways. One is by passing more federal criminal legislation that actually gets at the heart of some crimes that have not been maybe contemplated before. And that raises, um, that goes directly to the heart of the problem for which companies cannot raise a Section 230 defense. And the other part is to revoke the Section 230 immunity shield for those um, platforms who are aware of the unlawful conduct and content on their sites and are being deliberately indifferent to it, especially if they are profiting from it. So to the extent that Section 230 gives this immunity to a tech industry to regulate itself and to not get sued by people, that needs to go away. There's no reason to treat this industry as if it has uh, more reason to be more privileged, more um, insulated than other industries. We hold workplaces to account under Title VII. We hold educational spaces to account on, um, on Title IX. There is no industry that should be escaping the oversight of civil rights and protection of all people, especially when it comes to the kinds of harms that can devastate people's lives and actually lead to injury and death. And for those uh, who are maybe less familiar, Section 230 uh, is essentially, correct me if I'm wrong, a, a law that provides that providers won't be treated as publishers or speakers of the inf information on their websites. And as, as you mentioned, essentially immunizes social media against lawsuits over content on their sites. Um, Mary, I wanna turn to you. Uh, we have just a little bit of time left, but um, you have worked in law enforcement uh, or in the law enforcement world. I know you have some of the same concerns over how we all understand the First Amendment, as Marianne just voiced. Are there, you know, briefly things that the law enforcement community can do or should do short of waiting for laws and legal doctrine to change? Yeah, thanks. And I, I want to just foot stomp uh, what Marianne said, you know, when she mentioned the 1969 case, we're talking about Brandenburg, the case that arose out of the Skokie marches by, by Nazis at the time or planned marches. And basically it made it clear that uh, the First Amendment doesn't protect violence or incitement to imminent lawless activity. But in 1969, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have social media, we didn't even have cable TV, right? Um, and so the notion of what is incitement to imminent lawless activity has to be completely viewed differently when in nanoseconds, a one hateful treat, tweet inciting violence can be viewed by literally billions of people. And so um, we are way, way behind the times in, in, the, in terms of court cases in figuring out how to apply the First Amendment to social media. But from a law enforce, enforcement perspective, I, I think there's a couple things. One is, we really have got to eradicate extremism from law enforcement. Yes, police officers have First Amendment rights. They have First Amendment rights when they're um, speaking in their personal capacity on matters of, of public concern, but those rights are not limitless. They don't have a First Amendment right to be a police officer. And the Supreme Court and many other circuits have been very clear that government agencies, including law enforcement departments, may restrict the First Amendment rights of their employees when they need to do so in order to prevent the undermining of the mission or the efficiency or effectiveness of the mission of that government agency. Well, what could be more undermining to the mission of law enforcement than for its own members to be engaged in hate speech anti-government speech, white supremacist speech, um, you know, there's just no way they can actually be protecting their communities if those are the views they harbor. Yet too many law enforcement departments, I think, use the First Amendment as just like a shield of, whoa, nope, we can't touch that. And that is just not true. So to, to get to Marianne's point about sort of debunking and education, educating, debunk this, debunking this idea that the First Amendment is all protecting, I call it the mythology of the First Amendment. We really need to push back on that mythology because it's just, it's made up. It's not, it's not historical. Um, it's just that we've taken it to such a far extreme. And I also think the other problem, uh, and, I, and I don't mean that all law enforcement acts badly, of course, but I do think it's a, it's a scary thing sometimes for some departments to think about what kind of actions they can take about across, against their own members, partly because they're worried about being sued. And sometimes I think because they harbor some of those views themselves. Um, and we have to be honest about that. 
And the other thing related to that is that I think that also sometimes colors their views about whether something is really threatening. Threats are in, illegal in every state. It's not protected First Amendment activity. Uh, stalking, illegal. You know, these things are illegal, yet law enforcement will sometimes look at things like, you know, Kaya's examples, Taylor's examples, and sometimes say, well, this is not a true threat, right? So, you know, and partly I think it's confusion and lack of uh, real training and education and examples. If I have put up a photo of a hangman's noose and say, so-and-so should get what's coming to her, that's pretty darn threatening. And I think most ordinary people would see, would see it that way. Yet sometimes I think this isn't clear to law enforcement. So we really do need to have a discussion about uh, the impact, the serious impact, threatening impact of this kind of um, behavior online and why that really is not protected speech. Thank you. Um, we unfortunately have come to the end of our panel time, although I think it is obvious there is certainly much, much more we could discuss on this topic. Uh, I want to thank all of our panelists for your thoughts and insights, uh, what you have all said about this issue, including what can and should be done, is uh, something I think that really underscores that this is a problem requiring a multi-pronged solution um, and that there is much more work for us ahead. Uh, so thank you again to our panelists for spending your time with us today. Thank you to our audience as well for being so attentive while we tackled such a complex issue. Thank you, Ms. Gagenheimer, and the distinct